Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Ethanol Producer Magazine's 2016 Editorial Outlook. My name is Tom Bryan, and I'm President and Editor-in-Chief of Ethanol Producer Magazine, and I'm happy to be hosting today's program with our Marketing and Sales Director, John Nelson. Before I begin, uh, let me draw your uh, attention quickly to our event sponsor. Most of you will, will recognize uh, our, our sponsor. It is the FEW. Uh, if you haven't been to the International Fuel Ethanol Workshop and Expo, I highly recommend that you make plans to attend this year. We're going to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, we haven't been in Milwaukee since 2006, so after 10 years, we're returning uh, to a great uh, ethanol location, a great brew town, and we're excited about being uh, back in Wisconsin. Um, so thanks to the FEW for sponsoring today's webinar. We're excited about what we have to offer. And uh, before I begin, uh, I want to make a rundown of our uh, of uh, the things we're going to cover today. So we're going to provide a breakdown of our audience, our circulation, our online traffic, and uh, our wonderfully successful webinar series, uh, which we uh, uh, really built a lot of momentum with last year, and we're going to continue in 2016 with that strong momentum. Uh, John Nelson is going to walk you through um, all of those things and more. Um, and before we begin, I want to just say a few words about the industry, about the ethanol industry. Um, stopping just short of trying to give a State of the Union address, which I won't do, I wanted to uh, share with everyone how we here at Ethanol Producer Magazine feel about the state of the ethanol industry. We, we feel that the industry is currently uh, in very strong form this fall. We're all awaiting the EPA's final rule on its uh, renewable volume obligations, or RVOs, uh, those numbers for, for both uh, or for last year, this year, and for 2016. Um, and without getting into the weeds too much on the numbers or predicting outcomes, it is our opinion that the EPA's final rule, uh, which is expected out on or before November 30th, will leave the ethanol industry at best positioned for continued growth and at worst stable uh, and moving towards next generation biofuels targets. The bottom line is that the ethanol industry is holding strong and we're all expecting, expecting it to remain so through 2016. The EIA tends to agree. Uh, the EIA in its most recent short-term energy outlook said it expects the ethanol industry to produce an average of 942,000 barrels of ethanol per day in 2016 and uh, that's just short of being on pace with 14.5 billion gallons of ethanol a year, um, which is about what we're doing now. It remains uncertain what we'll see in terms of exports, uh, but no one's expecting those volumes to drop or change dramatically in the coming year. Um, and the overall market share for ethanol in the U.S. pool should remain at or close to 10%. Um, CoBank recently came out with an interesting report. Maybe some of you uh, saw that report, uh, but they reported that, uh, and CoBank's a a financial institute, institution that's uh, involved with ag lending and was really instrumental in the uh, the rise of the uh, modern ethanol industry. CoBank recently said that um, uh, following the 18 months of record earnings in the ethanol industry, uh, the whole industry is sort of rebalanced. We're looking at you know lower prices, tighter margins, but uh, the ethanol supply and demand situation has remained well balanced. These are CoBank's words. And producers have maintained positive earnings. Looking ahead through 2016, uh, the report said that uh, we're looking at uh, lean yet positive margins. And that's basically echoing what a lot of people in the ethanol industry are saying right now. Um, this is a $40 billion industry um, that requires an enormous amount of inputs, feedstocks, enzymes, yeast, chemicals, transportation services, and all manner of plant services. So if you're serving this ethanol industry, it's not only uh, its growth that matters, but its stability. And despite the possibly conservative margins that the industry is facing moving ahead, uh, most indications, almost all indications, point towards 2016 being a relatively strong, stable period for, for the business. Um, and before I go through the themes, we're going to turn it over to John Nelson, who is uh, uh, the Marketing and Sales Director for BBI International. John, please take it away. Thank you, Tom. Hello. I appreciate everyone taking the time to be on today's webinar. 
Ethanol Producer Magazine, the longest-running monthly magazine focused exclusively on ethanol production, and now entering its 21st year, is the industry's most recognizable publication and offers the best opportunity to gain mass exposure in the ethanol market. Ethanol Producer Magazine's print edition is distributed to 5,000 readers each month. More importantly, 941 of those readers are ethanol professionals from future or existing production facilities. And in addition to the 941 ethanol producers, every month we mail copies of the magazine to every U.S. ethanol production facility. So we, we can guarantee that multiple copies of the magazine go to each ethanol production facility every month. And as you can see on the slide here, with readers in 46 countries, a large portion of our circulation consists primarily of biofuels producers who represent the largest sector of our readership base. The graph also shows the next types of companies subscribe. They are equipment and service providers, consultants, technology providers, academics, farmers, and so on. And, and I want to put some emphasis on, on this statement that I'm about to make, but by purchasing advertising in Ethanol Producer Magazine, you can be assured that you are reaching the right people in the ethanol industry. And to further support that statement, I'd like to note that our audience of 17,000 comes from third-party research uh, we've done on our magazine. So when you look at that number of 17,000, you may go, how do we get to that number? Well, it came from third-party research. And on average, when surveying our readers, we see 3.4 readers per issue. So your advertisement will be seen by 17,000, and that's not including all the bonus distribution that will be attached to each issue that Tom will cover here in a moment. Uh, you can also see we have readers of our print magazine located all over the world with a primary readership uh, in the U.S. at 90 percent. So I I'm excited to discuss this slide because it contains data from our third-party research we've recently done on Ethanol Producer Magazine. And we have the luxury of having our art department make the data look nice on this slide. The research was performed by Signet Research, a firm located on the East Coast. And some of you may have even filled out the survey. So, you know, looking at it, what, what does the research say about our readership? Well, of those who completed the online survey, 42% were existing or future biofuels producers, with the largest sector being the top decision makers at the facility. Each reader spends, on average, 49 minutes per issue. And as I mentioned earlier, each copy of Ethanol Producer Magazine is read 3.4 times, bringing the readership of each issue to 17,000. Also, 71% of our readers are involved in recommending, initiating, or purchasing products or services. And even more important is the fact that 72% of our readers took action based on the ads they viewed in Ethanol Producer Magazine. Also, our survey showed readers visited the advertiser's website, discussed a product or service, recommended or made a purchase based on the ad they saw in Ethanol Producer Magazine. One last note is that 65% of EPM readers agree that advertisements educate and are an important part of the publication. So if, if you've been on the fence about advertising in Ethanol Producer Magazine, hopefully this third-party data will give you more assurance that advertising here is the right choice. <clears throat> We're extremely proud of, of the magazine's web presence. And through the use of our ongoing stories being posted to the site, search engine optimization, content from maps, blogs, ethanol webinars on demand, in the ethanol industry directory, we have increased our traffic to the numbers you see on this slide. These numbers are based on Google Analytics from our last update of July 2015. So we are currently, again looking at the slide, we are currently averaging more than 78,000 page views, or some people call them impressions, each month, and 44,000 visitors per month. We've increased the number of visitors to our site this year by 5.6%. And, and that's a big win. That's something we focus on. And so the fact that we've jumped that up to 5.6% up 
um, is something we were we were aiming to do when we accomplished that. We also have strong search features and a recommended article section on the website that helps visitors find the most relevant stories. And so, keeping visit, you know, what this does is it keeps visitors on the site longer. And as an advertiser, it means that people stay on our site longer, and the potential for someone to click on your online advertisement goes up. So we're, we're going to take a look at a quick shot of our demographic slide here. Uh, we have visitors uh, to our website from around the globe. Again, this is on ethanolproducer.com. We have visitors on our website from around the globe. And the slide here shows the top 10 visits by country. So clearly the U.S. is at the top by a large margin uh, with Canada, uh, India, U.K., and Brazil following. And so this, dem this is demonstrating that many companies from around the world, not just the U.S., are looking to understand the latest ethanol technology and policy. So if you're looking to reach both the U.S. ethanol audience and the global ethanol audience, ethanolproducer.com and online advertising is a great option for you. So now this slide is showing our social network reach. And, and why are we showing you this slide? It's, it's here to make you aware that we are actively promoting our stories on all the sites you see listed. And based on Google Analytics, we are seeing traffic come in from Twitter, Facebook, link, link, LinkedIn, excuse me, LinkedIn, et cetera. And if you're following um, this industry, you've probably seen some of our posts in the past. But what we want you to know is that every story, every important policy change, every event is posted to these sites. To give you an example, during the past two years, we've tweeted more than 4,000 times and accumulated 60, more than 65,000 or 6,500 Twitter followers. The goal of all this activity is to bring visitors back to ethanolproducer.com to read our stories and see your online advertisements or print advertisements in our digital issue of the magazine. So this next slide is, is showing you uh, some comments that were made from our Signet research. Again, our third party. These are from readers. I'll let you uh, kind of go through here and read these, but you can see um, this is um, they really showcase what we believe the readers get out of our magazine. Obviously, 100% useful, keeps me in touch with new innovations and what others are doing to improve their process and operations. So again, the content, is, as Tom mentioned uh, and will go into, is designed for ethanol production, and that's, that's who's reading this. And, and you can see, based on these comments, um, we seem to be on target, and people seem to be very happy with that. Um, and, and while some of you are keep reading the slide, one point that I believe many of you would find extremely beneficial is that we have an outstanding art department that helps produce this magazine. And when you purchase an advertisement with the Ethanol Producer Magazine, you gain access to the art department to help you design and create your advertisements free of charge. So again, if you say, hey, I'd love to advertise here, but I don't have an ad, well, they can produce it for you free of charge, and it can be a huge cost savings to you, the advertiser. Um, and, and a lot of the times, that's not talked about or it flies under the radar. So here we're looking at uh, our webinar series. And some of you may have seen advertisements for our webinar series, may have even been on our webinar series uh, or, or logged in. You know, sponsorships for Ethanol Producer Magazine uh, are a great option for companies that are looking to engage a specific audience for 90 minutes at a time. Attendance on these webinars has been strong, um, part, mostly because these events are content-driven and provide valuable information to the attendees provided from our industry expert panelists. So as a sponsor, you have your logo with URL listed on all the marketing emails that are sent out promoting the webinar, roughly 150,000. Uh, the, the Ethanol Producer Magazine website registration page, online advertisements, weekly newsletter ads, and our on-demand on webinar section of Ethanol Producer Magazine. So without a doubt, because we've been doing these webinars for two years, uh, we're confident that this is one of the best ways you can identify companies and people interested in a specific topic with, within the ethanol industry. And most importantly, in addition to all the promotional benefits I listed, as the main sponsor, the diamond level sponsor is what we call it, 
uh, we physically give you the contact information of all the attendees and the registrants of the webinar, email included. So what do, the, what do these packages look like? What do these sponsorships look like? Here we're, we're showing you a couple examples. Uh, as a Diamond webinar sponsorship package, you can see you get all the registering contact data. Um, you get to see who is most interested um, and how they rank based on their engagement during the webinar. You also see um, you are able to have a speaking opportunity on the webinar, you have top placement of your logo on all the marketing and so on. And so um, I just, you know, and then we also have a gold webinar sponsorship package and that's rate, rated at $5,000. So it's a lot of the same opportunities that you get as a diamond level sponsorship. However, you're not getting that contact information and you're not getting the top spot. And one thing I would note is as a diamond sponsor, you get a two minute commercial. As a gold, you would get a 30 minute or 30 second commercial. So um, on the right hand side, you see a couple examples of our of webinars that we produced. And you can see we have one with just a diamond level sponsorship with direct automation. You can see the other one on food safety. We had two sponsorships, uh, two sponsors, one diamond being Fibro and then U.S. Water was the gold webinar sponsor package. And these are successful webinars that we had. So this next slide, we're taking a look at, again, a couple examples. Here's what the main slide would look like. Here are the speakers that in, were involved. Again, as a webinar sponsor, you have the opportunity to have a speaking opportunity. So if you're saying, hey, I want to do one of these webinars and I want to reach the ethanol industry or the ethanol audience, this is a great opportunity to say to to contact us and we'll help you produce a webinar uh, that we think is a good fit. Um, you know, some examples here is, you know, we have one with direct automation again, and then we also have one with, with Fibro and U.S. Water. I do want to read, I have a quote here from Methus Energies, uh, a webinar we did with Biodiesel Magazine, but I want to read uh, a press release, a news release that they did um, talking about their webinar. And so I'm going to read that press release right now. Methus Energies International, a renewable energy company that offers an array of products and services to biodiesel fuel producers, announced today that 459 people registered for the webinar hosted by Biodiesel Magazine this past August 28th. The webinar was mostly attended by industry professionals such as biodiesel, such as biodiesel and ethanol producers. Methus used the webinar to introduce what is what it believes is a quote unquote game changer to the biodiesel industry relating to the way oils are pretreated before making biodiesel. Methus is very pleased with the number of attendants, but more importantly, with the several dozens of requests for additional information it received following the webinar. Calls have been coming in from all over the world, including from a number of billion dollar companies that are interested in its catalyst and related technology. Methods is currently working with several potential clients to help them evaluate and validate the catalyst and technology and is confident that many of them will move forward toward impl implementation. Nicholas Ng, president of Methods, said, we knew we had a game-changing technology, but we didn't expect the magnitude of the response and from some of the biggest companies in not only the biodiesel industry, but the ethanol industry as well. We are getting calls and emails on a daily basis and are engaged with some very big players with very large volumes of production. Looking at the U.S. alone, we could be adding significantly to our bottom line from equipment and catalyst sales over the next few years. Considering that most of that is recurring revenues, there is no need to say more as to why we are very, very excited. So again, I just wanted to read that, that press release. Um, it says a lot and it, it just shows you the value that you can receive by being a webinar sponsor. So I definitely encourage you to, to take a look at that. And with that said, um, I appreciate your time. And now I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Tom Bryan, president of BBI International and editor-in-chief of Ethanol Producer Magazine. Tom. All right. Thanks, John. Um, I got to tell you, it was uh, exciting and, and, and fun to uh, work on webinars throughout 2015. As I said earlier, we're just really looking forward to 
continuing to do that in 2016. Our editors, uh, Holly, Jess, and our managing editor, and our senior editor, Sue Rekishil, deserve uh, a lot of praise for the, the speakers that they lined up for our webinars in 2015. It's, uh, it's hard work for everyone. It's hard for the speakers. It's hard, it's hard for people to make time for us. Um, but in the end, I think we're reaching the right audience, we're reaching pretty big audiences, and uh, it's a great way to get these messages out, <laughs> and, and often very critical information. We recently did a webinar on the, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act and had hundreds of people join us for that. So we're, we're, we're tackling some pretty big topics, and I think doing it very well. I wanted to just uh, uh, praise John, really. John, John came on as marketing director a few years ago, and he's done a terrific job. I mean. He's taken us into the modern age along with other, other people at BBI. When we started this thing, of course, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was our, our website had very little traffic probably. Um, so to see 78,000 page views a month now uh, is just mind-boggling. Um, to, to see stats like uh, readers spending 49 minutes with our magazine per month is uh, humbling and, and gratifying for our staff. And it keeps us going. Um, so we're, we're just very excited about these numbers. Um, and uh, eager to, uh, to share some more with you here. Um, I'm looking right now at this contents page that we've, that we've uh, created for you to, to think about all the different things that we bring on a monthly basis to our print magazine. And again, I want to I wanna just highlight the work that Holly and Sue do on a monthly basis um, and our news editor, Erin Vogley, who's currently on maternity leave. We cannot wait till she comes back. Um, three of them really drive all the content forward for Ethanol Producer Magazine, from the features to the news department um, to collecting all the terrific columns that we have in the magazine every month, uh, whether it be from the RFA, Growth Energy, the American Coalition for Ethanol. Um, we've got a, a sort of a new column this year called Global Scene, where we're getting uh, columns from uh, the organizations in Canada, Brazil, and Europe and more. So we're, we're doing a lot of new things, and I think the magazine is in uh, probably the best shape it's ever been in in the uh, 20 years, 20 plus years of its existence. Um, with that, we will go ahead and get started with uh, walking through our editorial themes for 2016. I'll move pretty fast. I know everyone's busy. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, I did something a little bit unusual this year, uh, sort of unorthodox. We've got two themes for each month. One is a primary theme. One is more of a secondary theme. Uh, the primary theme is technical. It's position specific for ethanol producers. Uh, we, when we write stories, we think about we think about the specific positions in an ethanol plant, plant managers, lab managers, commodities managers, uh, EHNS. Um, we think we're writing to those people. So we so we created a lot of these themes around topics that would appeal to those people, and also. Uh, topics that appeal to all the, the hundreds of vendors and service providers that, uh, that also make this industry move forward. Um, the secondary theme is, uh, they're, they're broad topics, big issues, uh, sort of deep dives for us. Uh, so we can tackle these broad issues about whether it be CEO perspectives or international markets or the expansion of the marketplace, um, higher level type of issues that, uh, that a lot of people in the industry don't have time to think about on a daily basis. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in January. We're going to start the year with a look at microbial control. Uh, in most worlds, probably not the most exciting subject. For us, we find it highly exciting. Um, so why is microbial control in 2016 still an important topic in the ethanol industry? And why do I have pictures of uh, chickens and tanks here? Well, um, in this tighter margin environment, uh, it's my... It's our, our our team's opinion that the industry needs to sort of focus on uh, the nuts and bolts. We need to go back to the basics, and we need to talk about these big issues that affect day-to-day -day, uh, plant operations, um, these little things that end up making a big difference. So efficiency and optimization is going to be a fundamental goal for producers this year, as always. And uh, plants can't run optimally if, they're, if, they're, if their equipment and their processes are following up and forcing unplanned downtime situations. So, um, you know, a lot's changed in the ethanol industry over the years, in the, or in the past decade, let's say, but the same old nuisances haven't gone away. Bacterial contamination is still uh, something that's got to be mitigated and dealt with on a daily basis. And fortunately, the products, uh, the technologies on the market have, 
have never been better. Um, they're more diverse, they're more versatile, um, and producers are using these products in, in increasingly uh, creative and, and, and responsible ways. Um, simply said, when it comes to microbial control, ethanol plants have more choices, they've got more tools, and, uh, and they're more discerning. And so that's what we're going to feature in January. We'll bring in experts in the field to help us select topics on microbial control and, and think about ways that we can feature this stuff. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, cleaning, detection, uh, and of course the various antimicrobial options in dosing and best practices. Um, all of those types of things that we need to discuss, uh, we'll take a look at and we need your help. Uh, finally, we'll provide an update on the industry's ongoing response um, to the marketplace pressures and regulatory changes that uh, may or may not affect the way producers think about antimicrobials. Um, EPM senior editor uh, Sue Rekishill, who I mentioned earlier, just hosted uh, that webinar on food safety on the Food Safety Modernization Act, and um, and that included some talk about the utilization of antibiotics in the industry. Um, at the very least, we're going to see greater attention uh, drawn to antimicrobials under FSMA. So these are the types of topics that we're going to look at and consider for editorial um, content for the January issue. And uh, again, please contact us if you work in that sub, if you work in that area, um, or you're responsible for that, for any sort of microbial control in an ethanol plant. We want to hear from you. We need help from both producers and vendors in terms of planning, and uh, getting us on the right path with our story selection. This issue will be distributed at the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit. One of the uh, you know, I always think the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit is one of the highlights of the year. It's a, it, it's maybe not the world's biggest event, but it's one of the best, and it's a, it's an event right in the heart of ethanol country. Uh, we will be in the conference bags with this issue, so that's a great distribution. And before I move on, I also need to mention that January, that January issue, will be uh, hosting our brand study. As you can see on this slide, we've we built a brand study scheduled for advertisers in the month of January, and by purchasing an advertisement in this issue. Uh, you'll automatically be included in the study that will take place by a third-party research firm that John mentioned earlier. Our readers will rank how well they recognize your company's specific brand and leave comments about your company and advertisement, advertisement placed in eth Ethanol Producer Magazine. You'll have an inside look at how your company ranks in relation to other companies advertising in that issue. And at the end of the study, we'll provide you with a full report and a breakdown of the research results. Again, this is a this is completely free to advertisers in this January issue. So we hope to take full advantage of it, and uh, we will be able to provide you with, uh, provide you as an advertiser uh, with, this, with this advantage um, in January. So if you have any questions regarding the free study, uh, feel free to contact Chip, Howard, or Jeff. Those are our account managers for Ethanol Producer Magazine. And let's move on to February. Okay, so this is our commodities and margin management issue. You could also call this our risk management or risk mitigation issue. Again, it's sort of a sort of a back to the basics kind of theme. We are writing with uh, with a certain individual in mind. We're going to be writing with ethanol plant professionals who have fiscal or or uh, commodities merchandising responsibilities in mind when we put this together, and uh, specifically thinking about those commodity managers and risk managers uh, working in the space. Um, People who aren't really close to risk management might feel like this entire subject, the, the whole realm of risk, was figured out after the downturn in 2009. Um, and to that, we might say yes and no. While the ethanol industry did learn a lot the hard way six years ago, we shouldn't mistake today's higher level hedging sophistication as a sort of cure-all for, for risk. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, we're entering a more, we're in a more conservative margin environment right now. And, and I keep saying back to the basics um, or back to the fundamentals. Um, and this issue is certainly that. We're going we're gonna to look at um, the things that move margins, corn prices, ethanol prices, energy prices, exports, RINs, cash and debt management. Uh, we're going to do our best to deliver insight to producers on strategies for disciplined hedging and, and, and the tools and, and, and perhaps software and data that can, that can help producers do that. So. Um, there are a number of risk management and commodities merchandising firms in the ethanol industry. A lot of them do a great job. They all do a great job. Uh, we'll be reaching out to, to all those that we know for support and, uh, and hopefully 
uh, bringing you in for, for, for advice on where to go with this issue and, and what stories we should select. We will be distributing this at the 2016 National Ethanol Conference. It will be in the conference bags. Uh, of course, that is one of the premier events in the ethanol industry. Uh, this year's event is taking place down in New Orleans. Uh, should be a good one. Um, the secondary subject is growing global markets, so exports. Uh, we'll also tackle that in that issue. And we'll uh, as well be going to the Cooling Tower Institute annual conference. Moving on to March. March is uh, power and thermal. Uh, again, I keep saying back to the basics, but the March issue, uh, I joked earlier, it would be more like back to the future because as old school as ethanol plant heat and power seems as an editorial subject, I think everyone will find out that this issue will be filled with stories of innovation and even invention. Uh, there are numerous reasons why energy generation is back in the spotlight in the ethanol industry, whether it's for regulatory compliance, financial gain, or both. U.S. ethanol plants are increasingly adopting cutting-edge and alternative approaches to power and thermal energy. Uh, pictured right here, we've got on the top is a picture of Enercore. It's the Enercore Dresser Rand power oxidizer that was uh, featured uh, earlier this year in Ethanol Producer Magazine, and it was installed at one of Pacific Ethanol's plants out in California. Um, it's a good example of the kind of energy innovation that's being installed uh, the innovative uh, equipment that's being installed in the industry. And down below is a picture of a steam pipe uh, going over to Dakota Energy Ag, Dakota Energy Ag ethanol plant here in North Dakota, uh, coming, uh, steam coming from the co-located power plant. Uh, that's one of the newest ethanol plants in the country, and yet again, another example of energy innovation taking place in the industry. And just a few weeks ago, uh, there was a press release about Poet using waste wood um, at one of its plants in Iowa for biomass power. We hear about biogas. We're, there's a lot of talk still about innovations with waste heat recovery. So there's so much to talk about with uh, power and thermal, and I'm excited to bring this theme back to Ethanol Producer Magazine after kind of a multi-year hiatus. We used to cover power and thermal on a regular basis, and I think it's been a while since we've had it as a theme. This magazine, this issue, will go to the Growth Energy Executive Leadership Conference. That is down in Orlando, I want to say. And um, again, one of the kind of must-attend events of the year. We're excited to uh, distribute this issue there. And the secondary topic is growing the U.S. market. Uh, that's the kind of thing you'd usually see on a, maybe one of the covers of our magazine, and, and, it, and it might grace the cover of our magazine. Of course, growing the market for, for U.S. ethanol is uh, is critical and it's going to be a nice that secondary theme is a nice fit for the conference. Let's move on to April. We've got DCS and data management. This is a subject that uh, boy, if there was really one topic that jumped out at us last year, it was this one: data management. Um, at the end of the day, I did include DCS as as, as part of this theme just because distributed control systems uh, fit with data management and they're usually spoke about in the same context. So we will be tackling this subject. Um, uh, the other day I was listening to a program on National Public Radio and Adonami, they were talking about the, the fact that we're living in this golden age of data management. Um, and, uh, and we are now adapting technology at this mind-boggling pace in, in, in order to harness information from complex industrial and scientific data like never before. And they were, it was in the context of, uh, I believe, uh, medical information. But it got me thinking about the data management issues that we're hearing about in the ethanol industry. And I think a lot of the data people are thinking the same way in our industry. Um, last year, our team discovered just how exciting this has all become for ethanol producers after we were approached by various uh, DCS and data management firms with an interest in reaching producers with their software offerings. And that ultimately culminated in a series of webinars sponsored by Direct Automation. And it, and it then carried over, the, the enthusiasm in the topic really just kind of uh, carried on. And it carried over to the FEW uh, where we had a two-part series, Big Data 1 and Big Data 2, two different panels on data management that were very well attended. Um, and so this April issue is all about leveraging the various software and service provider solutions to capture, collect, and analyze 
information that will make your facility run better. And I think it's going to be a good one. This will be distributed at the 2016 International Biomass Conference and Expo. That will be in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's one of BBI's own conferences. And our secondary topic will be cellulosic ethanol plant updates. That's basically our way of saying we're going to call Poet, Abengo, and DuPont and ask for the latest updates on their uh, on their cellulosic ethanol plants, which should be uh, ready for sharing by by this spring. Um, let's move on to May. Corn oil, pretty simple uh, as a theme, but once you dig into it, there's a lot behind just those two simple words. Um, with most of the ethanol industry already having installed corn oil extraction, I know a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, why are we giving this this topic uh, so much attention? Um, in my opinion, corn oil continues to be a very big story in the U.S. ethanol industry. Uh, why? Because it has been a difference maker in our business, because it's, it's kept plants in the black, because the technologies related to its uh, extraction continue to evolve, because of the way it impacts other co-products, and because it was recently identified as a feedstock for one of the lowest emission fuels on the planet. The uh, California Air Resources Board CARB recently identified corn oil as the second lowest carbon intensive transportation fuel on the market, second only to biodiesel made from waste cooking oil. Cooking oil. Um, that's a potentially very big deal for, for corn oil and for this industry. Um, in, innovations in the marketplace are, are uh, there's many examples. Valacor, for, for instance, is a company we've worked closely with over the last few years uh, from an editorial perspective. And uh, they're offering a technology to produce two different types of corn oil now, one optimized for poultry feed, another one that's optimized for biodiesel production. So it's just very exciting things that are happening. Uh, we're hearing uh, other positive news about corn oil as a lubricant in various industrial applica applications. So there's a lot to look into, both from the marketplace side and the, and the production side. And ultimately, I, I think there are still emerging stories to tell in the corn oil space and we're eager, eager to just dig in and, and discover uh, what's there. Uh, so if you're a company that offers equipment, chemicals, process technology, anything related to corn oil separation, or maybe you're a company that markets corn oil, either way, uh, this is a great time to think about ramping up your presence in EPM, and, and more importantly, uh, please contact our editorial team. Again, uh, email or call Holly or Sue if you've got ideas for content, if you've got a contribution idea, or you want to be part of a story. Uh, we'd love to collaborate with you. This, our, our secondary theme here is product diversification, so a really tight fit with corn oil. We may, who knows, we may do a story on high protein meal or zine or high value chemicals. There's just so many different stories that we could tackle with product diversification. It's really that whole realm of biorefining. Um, and this will be our, the bonus distribution will be the hotel, what we call the hotel room drop at the FEW, where this this issue of the magazine is is, is, is goes to all the all the hotel rooms of the attendees of the uh, International Fuel Ethanol Workshop. So it's an, it's a very nice bonus distribution. It's also distributed at the American Oil Chemist Society annual meeting, good fit for corn oil, and the Distillers Grains Technology Conference, which is also a very good fit for any issues related to co-products. All right. Let's move on to June. Uh, we've got yeast and enzymes and yield maximization. Uh, this is a mainstay topic with, with our magazine, sort of reframed. And um, there's, there's always a lot to talk about with both yeast and enzymes. You've got innovation happening, happening almost continuously. Almost every year we're seeing new enzymes developed. We've got enzymes specifically designed for co converting corn fiber into cellulosic ethanol now. We've got enzymes specifically designed to enable producers uh, to lower their some of their chemical inputs. You've got corn seed with alpha amylase built into it, of course, and the list goes on and on. So there's there's a lot a lot of stories that um, perhaps not stories that we haven't covered, but stories that we could return to and provide updates on. Um, and there's also a lot happening with yeast. Yeast innovation is is a is a very dynamic space right now. Uh, there's again compelling stories to tell. There's there's stories about yeast nutrition and propagation. There's stories about uh, how new yeasts are being uh, uh, gaining approvals for again for uh, for uh, corn fiber conversion, and um, and this is an issue of Ethanol Producer Magazine that will likely enjoy a pretty robust participation from all the major enzyme and yeast manufacturers. 
and I think that's for good reason. It is going to the world's largest ethanol conference, the International Fuel Ethanol Work Workshop and Expo, as we've mentioned. Uh, so this is our big June FEW issue, and for many of you, uh, it kind of goes without saying, you know why uh, companies have a presence in the June issue of EPM. It is in front of that audience of 2,000 people, a quarter of which are ethanol plant employees and leaders. So um, that's the June issue. Let's move on to July. July, I'll try to pick up the pace here a little bit. July is cleaning practices um, and preventive maintenance. Uh, you know, we haven't covered straight up cleaning in a few years, but I think that this topic is uh, on the surface. You might think, well, what's to cover? It's always very, very rewarding to work with these cleaning uh, companies, industrial cleaning companies. They're, they're really a joy to work with in terms of uh, getting editorial content. And it's always amazing to, uh, to, to kind of live in their world. You've got a few companies, just a handful of uh, industrial service providers that are, that are doing biannual cleaning for, for over 200 ethanol plants. And our, you know, just a reminder, our industry provides 10% of America's fuel supply. And if these cleaning companies get their scheduling mixed up or if they don't come through, and they, uh, there's, there's a lot of production in jeopardy. So, you know, there's so many different routes we could take with this. Um, but the bottom line is the cleaning that goes on a couple times a year at every plant in America is a real feat. And it's accomplished with heavy equipment, technology, a lot of innovative products that are changing, and then just flat out manpower. So it's a fascinating story. And uh, we want to tell it, especially, you know, if it's every couple of years, we want to tell that story. And it's always changing. I think this is. Uh, this is an issue that's going to appeal to a lot of people who work in plants because these industrial uh, cleaning practices affect uh, plant maintenance. They affect production people. They, they affect EHNS. There's regulatory issues involved, safety issues involved. There's annual inspections that are sometimes uh, uh, have to be uh, uh, have to happen simultaneously to these uh, these cleanings. So there's a lot of things going on here and. Uh, so many different avenues we could take. Uh, we've got a lot of good friends in the cleaning industry. We know that uh, all the companies will, uh, will step forward and certainly help us with the planning of this issue. Um, preventative, preventative maintenance is the secondary issue, secondary theme, and uh, obviously a very close fit with cleaning because cleaning is actually uh, a form of preventative maintenance. Uh, this will be mailed to all the attendees of the FBW. Uh, so again, very good bonus distribution, and it will also be distributed at the uh, American Society of Egg and Biological Engineers Conference, which is a, a pretty big event. Let's move on to August. August is regulatory compliance. Um, in the last year, I did a story on environmental health and safety. I, I, I did this piece that was sort of an inside the life of uh, a few EHNS managers, and I was amazed by the sheer number of things that those guys uh, are responsible for in an ethanol plant. The bottom line is that if if it involves paperwork or or some sort of compliance, these EHNS managers are probably in charge of it. And so, in 2016, uh, we're not going to do that. We kind of covered that last year. We did the inside the life of an EHNS manager, and I think I think uh, what we need to do now is something that's um, you know a couple stories that are that are broader. We want to we want to tackle the issues that are the big compliance issues of our day, uh, whether it be emissions compliance, stack monitoring, leak detection, uh, you know, just any number of waste stream mitigation, worker safety, um, OSHA's hazard communication standard was a big, has been a big deal over the last couple of years. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the FDA's Food Safety Modernization Act, which often falls on the plates of the safety, the, the EHNS people, um, is also a very big deal. And everyone's waiting through that right now. So. Um, we're not really committing to any one topic there. There's a lot of different avenues we could go. We plan to work closely with the companies that help producers with regulatory compliance. So I'm talking about consultants, technology providers, equipment suppliers, across the board, uh, we want to talk to you uh, about this issue. And we'll start planning that. Uh, I just want to mention that all of these issues, this is the August issue. We'll be writing those stories in probably May. So just to give everyone an idea of the, the time, well, maybe June, I should say, not May probably June, those stories would be written. So just to give everyone a, 
time frame of when you've got to contact us in terms of getting in on contributions or uh, being a part of these stories. You want to get with us early and start talking a few months ahead of time. Uh, September is rail and transportation. And I think the focus is really going to be on rail. Um, again, it's very uh, sort of uh, kind of a throwback topic to 10 years ago. But as we thought about these issues um, and what were some of the biggest issues of the day, uh, rail seemed to emerge, at least for me. And I think we can have fun with this topic. Uh, personally, I envision this issue being, uh, lar again, largely about rail and rail car issues, but certainly we can, we can make room for other stories, whether it be truck barge, transloading, shipping. We're open to whatever ideas come our way. Um, but our industry moves on rails. We, uh, when, when rail car regulations change, the entire industry is affected. When rail cars are expensive, we're all affected. Uh, rail lines, when they're congested, the industry is affected. And we've seen that over the last couple of years with the emergence, the explosion really of, probably a bad choice of words, of uh, rail cars from uh, coming out of the Bakken, in and out of the Bakken. Uh, I read a report that 500,000 rail cars transported oil uh, in the United States uh, over the last couple of years on an annual basis compared to just 10,000 um, uh, back in 2008, 2009. So those rail cars are competing with the ethanol industry today. We hear about the slowdown in the Bakken, um, but what a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that it's a drilling slowdown, not a production slowdown. There's still oil coming out of the ground at near record volumes, and so those rail cars are still being used, and um, and we'll we'll continue to run into those issues. A lot a lot's been figured out, but we'll still have congestion issues. So I think that could be covered. I think, um, and to give you an idea, I, I, this report. Uh, that I read just this morning uh, said that you know there's 290,000 tank cars that, that transport uh, transport ethanol on an annual basis. So there's a there's a lot a lot to cover and certainly a huge volume of, of cars and that's just tankers. That doesn't include the hopper cars carrying distillers grains and corn. Um, rail is a huge part of our industry and uh, and we we look forward to uh, to really vetting out this issue and finding finding the biggest issues to cover. Um, so if you work in the rail industry, again, give us a call. We want, we want your advice. We want to know where to go with this. This is going to be distributed at the uh, Big Iron Farm Show in Fargo, North Dakota. Not a big city, but a huge event. 64,000 people walk through that, that show every year, and there's 1,000 exhibitors. So it's a very big show, and certainly that's an audience of ag people, a lot of farmers, a lot of equipment people that, that um, are very familiar with the rail industry, and I think that putting rail on the cover of that issue is going to catch a lot of attention. All right, October. October is the lab and quality control issue. Our lab, it's really our lab issue. Um, and when it comes to ethanol plant employees who really, in my opinion, take, take great pride in their work and, and really step up to whatever challenge a plant has, um, it's, it's the ethanol plant lab people. I mean, the lab managers are really on the front lines of protecting a facility from all sorts of inefficiencies and problems. And uh, we've learned a lot. Our team here at Ethanol Producer Magazine has learned so much from lab managers over the last couple of years. It's been really rewarding. Uh, we've, we've had great interactions with lab individuals from in terms of doing stories. We've had great input from lab managers at our uh, huddles at the FBW, and uh, we can't thank them enough. So we'll continue to uh, host lab issues as a theme here in October. And, um, you know, uh, this year, I'm not sure we'll, where we'll go in 2016 with the topic, but, for example, this year we covered how HPLC and other analytical equipment like gas chromatographs and pH meters and moisture analyzers and hydrometers, all these things used in the lab, are only as accurate as their calibration, their stability, and their method of use. Sue Rekishil dug into that topic uh, with the help of some lab managers and did a great job. And um, it really gave us a lot of insight in, into how lab managers check their equipment and, and, and best practices and so forth. Um, Holly, uh, in the same issue, contributed a story on data analysis and software. Again, kind of opened our eyes to this whole world of data management and, uh, and in that case, how it, how it was data uh, helped uh, labs run run better. 
And so I think the question for us this year, heading into next fall, will be what um, uh, what what lab issues can we cover next? I mean, if you work in a lab, you service labs, or you're a provider of equipment and technology, please reach out to Holly and Sue with whatever ideas you might have. And this will be, uh, not by coincidence, uh, distributed at the Fuel Ethanol Laboratory Conference, which is put on by Midland Scientific and Midwest Laboratories. It's a very well-attended lab conference in the industry, kind of a quiet one that a lot of people don't know about unless, you're, unless you work in labs. But uh, 500 attendees, it's a, it's a very good event, and we're happy to be there. Storage will be our secondary topic. By that, we probably mean grain storage. I, I think every couple of years, doing an update on how ethanol plants are, are managing their storage, uh, maybe building out their storage or not, is always an, uh, an interesting story. OK, let's look at November. We're almost done. Corn fiber. Uh, so corn fiber and corn stover uh, will be covered in the November issue. Um, as we all eagerly await the full commissioning of the big cellulosic ethanol plants, oh, at Abbott and Go and DuPont, who are using you know, like corn cobs and corn residue, uh, most of you are well aware that there's another cellulosic feedstock out there that, that is sort of the low-hanging fruit for our industry, and it's corn fiber. So we're dedicating this issue in November to uh, issues related to corn fiber, and, and by that I mean the conversion of corn fiber into, into cellulosic ethanol. Um, it represents such an enormous opportunity for our industry and, and for the advanced biofuels sector in America, uh, and we simply had to dedicate an entire issue to it in 2016. There are several companies pursuing corn fiber to cellulosic ethanol platforms, and along with them, service and technology providers are uh, supporting the effort. So there's there's a lot of companies involved, a lot of science behind this, and 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 a lot of investment dollars behind this. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've got enzyme companies that are developing specific enzyme suites for corn fiber conversion. You've got specialty yeasts that are being rolled out and gaining approvals. Um, you've got strategic partnerships that are forming to test, commercialize, and license the build out of this new form of ethanol and uh, and it's all very exciting because because corn fiber uh, based cellulosic ethanol uh, could represent a couple billion gallons of new capacity and it all qualifies for D3 RIN so there's a lot at stake here and and a whole lot to cover um, we'd love to feature predominantly any producers if there's ethanol plants out there that are engaged sort of first movers in this space we'd love to tell those stories um, and continue to feature the uh, the plants that are at the forefront of this movement and finally oh yeah let's finally move on to December uh, process chemicals and you can see as we move through this entire year that the, the themes were they are pretty basic pretty simple but behind every one of these themes is, is um, a whole lot of complexity. Process chemicals, I, I joked earlier with someone, I said, you know, I don't think a lot of magazines would choose process chemicals as a, as a theme uh, for one of their months. Uh, we would, because we know how indispensable these various uh, cleansers and aids and additives are to the everyday operation of an ethanol plant. And uh, while it's true that some producers are getting by with less inputs these days, less chemical inputs, and uh, utilizing additives with greater discretion. Um, process chemicals are in fact playing an important role in helping plants achieve greater yields, greater efficiencies, and, and ultimately better margins. So there are a number of ways to go at this subject, but I think one of the stories that needs to be done for our readers is a sort of process aids and additives 101 type of story, a comprehensive overview of how, where, and why chemicals are used in ethanol plants. I think that would be well received, and um, and we could look at the technologies behind um, behind these chemicals, how producers are assessing the results of using these chemicals, and um, and just all the various applications from process enhancement to water treatment to scale mitigation. There's just so many areas where these important additives are used, and I think uh, a lot of our readers probably don't have a great understanding of of the details, and we like to provide that. Um, what I discovered while hosting a recent webinar on corn oil, it was on optimizing corn oil extraction, is that these chemical companies do way more than just push product out. I mean, these guys 
are acting as advisors to their ethanol clients and helping them set up plant chemistries that are really tailored for whatever production goals the producer wants to achieve. So I was amazed by the level of service and how helpful these, uh, these, these companies are in terms of helping their customers not use, surprisingly, not use too much chemicals at times. They're just uh, super supportive. And, uh, and 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 very great, uh, good to work with. So we're we're looking forward to collaborating with some of these companies from an editorial perspective uh, next year. Um, I look forward to working with everyone. And um, again, on all of these issues, and uh, my main message today is: if you've got an idea about the direction of some of our stories, or you could help us or contribute an article yourself, please give us a call. Contact us anytime. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, and once again, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, the FEW. We hope to see you all in Milwaukee, Wisconsin next June. In the meantime, there's going to be a whole lot of planning that goes into that conference, the agenda development, uh, the expo, um, um, on and on. So we'll be doing a call for, for, uh, for speaker presentations and building out that conference as the year goes on. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to John Nelson. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that thorough overview of what's to come in 2016. I also want to mention on in regards to the FEW, uh, we do have speaker abstracts open. So if you are interested in speaking uh, at the FEW, uh, definitely submit an abstract. Uh, you can go online and do that. So uh, as, as we're talking about upcoming events, uh, we do have uh, a number of events coming up here that you may be interested in. Tomorrow we have Biomass Magazine's 2016 edit editorial outlook, and that's hosted by myself and Tim Ports. Um, and then we also have the National Advanced Biofuels Conference and Expo taking place next week in Omaha. And we have an outstanding lineup of speakers there. Uh, we have, uh, just to name a couple, we have Todd Becker, who's the President, Chief Executive Officer, and Director of Green Plains. We also have a general session panel called the Belt, uh, Beltway Update. It's examining the policy foundation of the advanced biofuels industry. And that is going to feature Michael McAdams, who's the President of the Advanced Biofuels Association, Joe Job, CEO of the National Biodiesel Board, and Monty Shaw, uh, which many of you would recognize. Uh, he is the executive director of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. And again, that is that panel um, uh, will be led by Tim Ports, who's the vice president of content here at BBI. We also have a tour of ICM's pilot facility. So if, you're, uh, if you have time, I definitely would urge you to to, to head over to Omaha next week and, and uh, join us for the National Advanced Biofuels Conference and Expo. We also have uh, Landfill Methane, uh, Capture for Cash, Compliance, and Clean Air, a Biomass Magazine webinar series coming up November 10th. And then we have one more editorial outlook here, uh, Pellet Mill Magazine's editorial outlook for 2016, and that is November 19th. And as we mentioned early, uh, we have an exclusive discount for all of you who have stayed on online with us. We appreciate you staying on. And uh, by attending this webinar, you can save 35% on one full page print advertisement in Ethanol Producer Magazine. And that is exclusive to new advertisers. And that offer will expire June or January 1st. So if, if that is of interest to you, please contact either Howard. Uh, Chip or Jeff, and, and they would be able to walk you through what that means. Um, again, thank you for being on today's webinar. If you have any questions regarding Ethanol Producer Magazine, please, please contact us. We also hope you'll choose to engage the ethanol audience via Ethanol Producer Magazine in 2016. Thanks again, and have a great day.